Welcome and congratulations, Marla. We're very excited to uh, be able to share this time with you this afternoon and get to know you a little bit better. I um, would like to have you begin, just in general, tell us your Fort Hay story. Tell, you know, what is your background? What brought you to Fort Hayes? And, you know, having been both a student and a faculty member here, I assume your Fort Hayes story might be a little more expansive than some. So, but please share that with us. Okay, I think you know me too well, Charlene. Um, I don't lack for words. So, yeah, my story, uh, my Fort Hayes story um, is um, certainly not unique, but um, um, I could call it an Ellis County story because I never left home. Um, I mean, not for any length of time. But I grew up on a farm in um, Ellis County and there were six children um, in our family. And our parents um, raised us to work hard, lots of value placed on work, and always to do our best. And they also um, placed a very high value on education. And I believe it's because they themselves did not have an education. Um, well, my mother went to high school, but my dad only uh, went to the eighth grade. So they, at a very early age, said, all of you will be going to Fort Hayes because it's just 10 miles away. So um, we had no choice. And we heard this probably as preschoolers. Anyway, uh, went to Catherine grade school, went to Marion High School, and um, my Fort Hayes story starts in 1969 with my first experience. And this is, um, well, I'm, people who know me know that I'm honest, and that has gotten me in trouble, but this is the story of my first visit to Fort Hayes. I didn't know what I was gonna major in, um, but I thought possibly teaching. Um, and so I was assigned an advisor in education. And when I walked in the door, he greeted me and I handed him an envelope, which I knew had my ACT score in it. Um, so he opened the, well, he greeted me and we chatted a while and then he opened the envelope and he then proceeded to say, gosh, Marla, your score would predict that you are going to have a very difficult time with college classes, but you can try. Um, so I'll get you enrolled and you, I would recommend you visit the Votech School in Hayes and um, explore what they might have to offer because I feel like it's going to be a better match for you. And he wished me well. And I left and I was devastated because my parents said, I have to go to Fort Hayes. Um, so anyway, I just wasn't sure what I was going to major in. But um, as a sophomore, I sort of stumbled on to intro to speech correction. Um, and I met Chuck Wilhelm and Marsha Bannister and graduated in 1974 with a master's degree in speech pathology. And then two years later, they called, because um, I was living now on another farm in Ellis County, um, called and asked if I would consider being a part-time supervisor. And I agreed. Then um, in 1994, when our department grew, I applied for and was selected as a, for a clinical coordinator position. And, um, so I could have never imagined what the next 20 years would be like, um, but um, it was amazing. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so um, how does one go from being a speech major to being a speech language pathology major? Well, yeah, we were in the Department of Speech. Um, and speech language pathology was an area of emphasis. And back in the days, you could, you would get the degree, the bachelor's in speech, but then you would get an emphasis in speech pathology, radio and TV, debate. I mean, I don't even know what the other names of majors were, but yeah. Um, so then 
there were there was a core set of courses that allowed you to um, kind of specialize in one area, but the degree was actually speech. Okay. And then the master's, of course, was the speech pathology, and that was a specialty. Oh, okay. And at that time, you couldn't even, well, you couldn't practice with a bachelor's degree. The um, terminal degree for a practitioner was a master's degree, even back in, you know, the 70s. So, so do you wonder what this um, instructor who first met with you when you were first being recruited, what he might say now, seeing that you're uh, the recipient of this award? Well, honestly, I don't know. I think in those days, he was doing his job and he was being honest. And I think in some ways, numbers defined possibly more who you were. And, you know, I was a good student. And again, I worked hard, but probably a strong B student in high school. So, um, yeah, I think he would be proud of me. But I think he honestly just did his best with what he knew. And did that experience inform the way that you worked with students later on when you became a faculty member? Well, Charlene, actually it did uh, only because I just believe that, um, you know, you certainly have to have the knowledge and you have to under understand the science of speech language pathology, but there's an art to it too. And there's the ability to interact with people and to understand what needs to be done at what time and to be sensitive and to be intuitive. Um, so it's truly a combination of art and science. And yeah, um, I think it did influence some of how I supervised because I placed value on both and I, I wasn't just looking at numbers and I think we all were like that in our department. So um, are there, when, when I think of speech language pathology, I certainly think of Geneva Herndon, you know, and I don't know how many folks around would still remember her. And I don't know if you had a relationship with her, but did you, did you know her at all? Actually, I met her and um, I believe it was in, um, not, I was trying to look at the date, 1986. I was a part-time supervisor. We were in Malloy Hall and um, the, the clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, was, um, we named the clinic on the behalf of our founder, Dr. Herndon. And um, it was a very special day. I remember it like it was yesterday. And she was there and Dr. Marsha Bannister really was influential in planning the whole ceremony. And it was quite a deal. Um, being in the theater in Malloy and on the stage and it was it was beautiful for her but I I knew Dr. Herndon to say hello to her and chat with her but not really more than that uh, but she must have been an amazing woman and Marcia knew her much better and um, definitely worthy of having this clinic named after her because she did amazing things back when nobody had heard of speech language pathology so um, speaking of uh, the growth of our program here, um, one of the things that you speak about in, and that others speak about on your behalf in, in the materials that we received was your work with the Scottish Rite. Oh, can you yeah. Tell us, can you tell us about that? Oh my, yes. I was um, relentless, let's just put it that way. Um, I think, let's see, uh, we became a Scottish Rite Clinic, I believe in uh, nine, I have to really kind of look at the dates here. Um, yeah, well, I took them on as a challenge in my spare time because I had heard that uh, two other universities in the state of Kansas were receiving financial help for their clinic because philan their philanthropy was helping children with speech language and reading disorders. And I'm thinking if they're helping two other universities, east or south or wherever they were, 
then they need to hear about Fort Hayes. So I call it a five-year courtship. It seemed to take forever, but um, I kept in touch with them. I visited them. I made phone calls. And um, finally, after about five years and one visit, once they came to the clinic, the deal was sealed. Um, they agreed to um, be a partner with us, and we officially dedicated the uh, Herndon Clinic as a right care clinic in two. 2008. And, and what that means is it was very special to them, special to us too. Um, but what that means is they, as their budget allows, will financially support therapy or fees, materials, whatever our clinic needed um, for um, the, uh, for children who have speech and language and reading problems. And it, it was a wonderful day and many people were there to celebrate. And, um, you know, I still have friends in the association or the organization that keep in touch with me. And um, yeah, it was good. And it's something that I honestly had to work so hard at. I feel like you know, I'm, I'm so proud of it. Other people helped, but I'm the one that just wouldn't give up. Well, I, I know that that has had a huge impact on this university and that program for sure. So we yeah. certainly appreciate that you didn't give up. That's, yes. that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you know, throwing a little bit of my personal knowledge of you in, in the mix here. Um, I know that uh, when I was on the board of the Children's, Hayes Area Children's Center, um, we were celebrating our 50th anniversary, and you were invited to come be our guest speaker because of your long association with HACC. So can you tell us about that and, and other agencies across the state that you've uh, been a part of? Oh, yeah. You know, um, I just loved what I do, what I did, and at every chance to... Uh, be involved in community or in committees and, um, you know, groups and state associations. I just had a hard time saying no. Um, but you're right. Uh, I have a longstanding history with what started out as the Hayes Daycare Center for Exceptional Children, and then it went to the Early Childhood Developmental Center, and now it's the Hayes Area Children's Center. And I was there sort of through all of it. Um, again, students by my side, um, working with um, children with disabilities, birth through five. Um, and yeah, I, um, I had just some interesting experiences. Um, and I know I was influential and I tried my best to help students understand the importance of early intervention because uh, it can and does make a difference. And I had a couple of stories. I don't know, Charlene, if I can <laughs> interject them now, but they're, yeah, let me all uh, try not to be too windy here. Um, but they were all in relation to my work at uh, connected with the Children's Center and they were on home visits. Um, because it came, became apparent probably more than 10 years ago that early intervention, birth to three, really needed to happen in a natural environment, in the home, not in a center. So I would always get permission to have students with me, but we would make home visits. So um, the first story I want to tell is we were in a home evaluating a child with Down syndrome, and um, the mother just began crying, and um, I wasn't quite sure what to do, and the student, of course, wasn't sure what to do, um, and so I say something like, I see you're upset. I understand. She stopped crying. She looked at me, and she said, do you have a child with Down syndrome? And I said, no. And she said, well, then you don't understand. And she was upset, angry, whatever. And I mean, that was one of those what I call teachable moments. And I'm not even sure what happened after that, but we sort of 
reconnected and she became probably one of my favorite families and her son to work with. And then the other story I've told, and I know you've heard this, that uh, we were going into a home um, to, again, student with me, we were going to um, evaluate an infant who was born with a disability, um, a syndrome of some sort. And um, so I'm introducing myself and saying what I can offer and just trying to explain why I was there and how I could help. And the dad, there was a mom and a dad in that visit. And the dad looked at me and said, you know, Marla, um, I really don't need to know what you know, but I do need to know how much you care. So there again, another moment of, oh my, you're right. And, um, and then he just left the room and the student and I and the mother just started whatever we started. So I've learned so many lessons from parents and from students and of course from teachers. But um, my experience, again, with families, with committees at the, um, at the state level, as well as the local level, um, have made me sort of who I am. And it's, I've been very fortunate. So um, just to, you talked about a couple of different syndromes, just uh, because I think it might be interesting to others um, who might not be aware. Can you talk about um, the impact of your profession, uh, and especially early intervention on autism? Oh, you know, um, I, right, I mean, I haven't had a lot of experience with autism, but I know speech language pathologists um, are important members of all early intervention teams because the the characteristics of a child with autism, and I know the diagnosis is coming earlier and earlier, and you can see some of this in infant, well, I shouldn't say infants, in that first year. You can see social problems, you can see interaction, yeah, interaction problems, you can see early communication problems. Um, and so those characteristics and those um, whatever, I, I guess, signs, um, the speech language pathologist is part of those early intervention autism teams and um, the incidence has of course really you know the research has shown that there's more kids that have those symptoms and have been diagnosed so you know our profession we have specialists speech language pathologists who only focus on autism and one of our um, alums Dixie Teeter she is on this specialized state of Kansas autism team that they travel around the state and provide support. And she's a leader. She's a leader in the state. And then our own Amy Finch, before she was, she retired, um, people came, families came from far and wide to see her because she loved working with kids who couldn't talk, but had something to say. So, um, you know, I just admired those people and know that, you know, that's one of the many things that you can specialize in as a speech language pathologist. And nowadays it's big. It's a, it's a, there's a need there for that. Right. Absolutely. So um, can you explain to us what it means? One of, one of your many awards is that you are a fellow with the American Speech Language Hearing Association. What what does that mean? What is and, a fellow? <laughs> and what did you, what, and how did what did you do to earn that distinction? You know, that's what I asked uh, Fred Britton when I found out he nominated me. I said, "What did I do to earn this award? I've just done my job." You know, tell me. So here's the story again. Another story. Um, back in two thousand and wait a minute, no, 1996, right. Um, he shows up at my door with an envelope and he says, here, Marla, I have something for you. And I said, 
okay. Uh, and he said, why don't you open it? Well, so I opened this envelope and in it is a letter from the American Speech Language Hearing Association congratulating me on being a fellow. And I just was in shock. I was speechless. I said, what is this? Where did it come from? So he had engaged who knows how many people to write letters for me and to, he made the primary nomination and he nominated me for in three different criteria. And one was for clinical service, the other was for teaching, and the other was from because of service to my our state association. And I knew nothing about it and, until again, like he hands me this letter. So um, he wanted to surprise me because he wasn't sure I would be chosen and then I wouldn't be excited and then I wasn't chosen, whatever. He had his reasons. So um, after I settled down, I um, read the packet and uh, read letters. And there was this wonderful letter from a parent. And I don't know if I have time, but it, I, it's just a few sentences that I took an ex excerpt from it. Can I read it? Because sure, it's, it's, it's about me, but it's also about the students, because they worked alongside me, I worked alongside them. So here's the excerpt. Marla and her students provided services for our son for four years. Our son's needs were not like those of a typical child who is speech delayed. He had many differences in anatomy that made speech more difficult. As a parent with many obstacles in starting the journey in raising a child with special needs, Marla and her students were always positive and supportive. My family is blessed to have had the opportunity for her to touch our lives in such a positive way. So whatever documentation Fred sent to Asha, I must have met. And so therefore, that's what that award means. And it's the highest honor that can ever even be bestowed on a practitioner. Um, and I just, it was definitely the highlight of my career. Didn't really change what I did, but it just was amazing. <laughs> I don't know. I just did what I did. Well, and I think that's why everyone loves you is because it's like, and you said this about this award too. I hope I'm not I outing did. you with that. You know, what have I done to deserve this? And, and, and you're saying the same thing about the fellowship. And, and I think it's clear that uh, with these testimonials and, and having Fred, you know, wanting to make sure that you were honored thusly, I, clearly you've made an impact and that's why you're receiving all of these, these honors. So Thank I think it's, it's well, well earned. So um, we have lots of questions for you. So, but can I just say, I, I feel like I have to talk about the people at Fort Hayes who inspired me and helped me along the way. Absolutely. Can I do that real quickly? Um, there's been a lot of professionals that um, have had an impact on me and who I am, but I really want to focus on the people from Fort Hayes who were right by my side during my 37 years. Um, I have to mention Marsha Bannister first. She was my teacher, a fellow faculty member, my department chair, and now she's my dear friend. Um, she's been my inspiration and role model for more than 40 years. Chuck Wilhelm, I stumbled onto his introductory class. He scheduled a meeting with me, convinced me I could be a good speech language pathologist, and I believed him. Fred Britton, we've talked about him. He was my cheerleader. He taught me how to travel outside the state of Kansas. <laughs> he convinced me to run for a national office at ASHA. And then he took the lead in nominating me for this award. And then I already talked about Amy, but she inspired me because she transformed the lives of children and their families and the children with severe disabilities. And she was one of a kind. So I want to go up a level. I want to thank the deans. Virgil Howe was the first dean of our college, um, and his vision got us off to a good start. Tony Fernandez was next. I didn't know him well, but he seemed like a very kind man. And then Jeff Briggs is our current, our current dean, and the college has been reorganized, but 
when I was there. Um, it was the College of Health and Life Sciences. So I just want to give them a little message. Um, I feel like they all showed dedication and support for every department and each faculty member. I just felt like their doors were open and they were so approachable. Their expectations were high and convinced all of us that we were good, but we could always get better. I'll never forget that. And then the students, you know, where would I be? I wouldn't be a, have a clinic to coordinate if the students weren't there. And I sort of took account that I could have spent um, time with more than about 500 students in the classroom, in the clinic, and in my office and um, it was fun to watch them grow and change and develop and um, anybody that knows me knows I loved gradu Forte's graduation it was my favorite day of the year um, and I don't know you know it's been great and now uh, it's fun to look back on all of that now well, I'll be quiet <laughs> Well, now, now you have to answer other questions, not just my sure. question. Okay. So uh, our first question, and I think this was asked while you were telling us about all of your siblings who in your parents' expectations. So okay. were you actually here on campus with any of your siblings? Um, I was, I was. Um, my, one of my sisters worked a little bit and then came to school, um, came to Fort Hayes later and then my sibling right older than me was three years older than me so she was when I was a freshman one was a junior and one was a senior and we all got together in our little Corvair um, and uh, drove from Catherine to Fort Hayes every day and it was just not handy because we got to campus at eight o'clock and we couldn't leave until five o'clock. We were there all day, every day because we all rode together. And we also had work study jobs on campus. And so, yeah, we were all together for probably one year. Nice. That's, I mean, that's a lot all on campus at the same time. <laughs> eight hours a day, <laughs> five days a week. And I spent a lot of time in the library studying. I actually worked there too, but you know, yeah, I spent a lot of time and I envied, I looked over at the dorms at that time and just thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to live in the dorm? You could just walk over and be in your, you know, room and no, I had to wait till we all got together and headed back home. Cause our dad just said, well, I'm not spending more than one take of gas on you three. So just do it. That sounds like a, a good Kansas dad, that's for sure. <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, Mike Slattery is wondering what you consider to be your greatest accomplishments in your field. Oh, Mike, that's a hard question. I don't, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like being awarded that ASHA Fellow was sort of a, summar a summary of things that I did well. I, I mean, I feel like um, the services I provided to children and their parents was as good as I could do and I always kept up with the current literature and the best practices um, you know how I managed the clinic you know I was the first one so I had no one to really I, I mean Marsha Bannister helped me with ideas and the whole faculty would help we were definitely a team but I was sort of breaking ground for what a clinic coordinator does. Um, and then, you know, just service in the community. I felt like I just never missed an opportunity to get, to get involved with services that would impact children with disabilities. And so I, I don't know that there's any one thing, but it's kind of a combination of, um, opportunities that I took advantage of and then met great people that then later, you know, one thing led to another and that I think I've said that before. So, so you mentioned uh, Jeff Briggs as being one of your deans. Uh -huh. he, he has a question for you. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> I think you can handle it. 
you what know, have you I, seen, yeah, what have you I, seen I, as the biggest changes in the field over your years of service? Oh, the biggest changes I feel like are, well, first of all, every, when I talk to practitioners, they're all overwhelmed. I can't say they're all, every one of them, but they seem overwhelmed with the incidence and prevalence of children with problems. If they work in the schools, their caseloads are too large, the children they have are more complex than they used to be, and some of that is, you know, social problems, and, you know, I'm not even talking about COVID. Um, it's just been a gradual um, increase, and I, I don't necessarily hear the enthusiasm or the the fun that I wish they were having, but I would be the same way. I, you know, when you have too much to do and too many kids to see, and they have such severe problems, and you worry about them going home at night, you know, is that what you went to school for? You know, you went to school to be a speech and language pathologist. So that's changed. And then, of course, with the COVID changes and all the remote uh, therapy. Um, I think, you know, again, um, Fort Hayes was ahead of the game in all that. Uh, in fact, I think I heard Jeff mention that the other day on his, um, when he was on Tiger Talk. But um, actually, the last year I was there, um, we, Dr. Briggs and me and the chair at that time, Jane Brandle, um, traveled to um, Ensign, Kansas, because they were short staffed as a speech language pathologist on their, you know, for their services. And they agreed to engage in what they called, or we called then telepractice. And we hired a faculty member and she worked either out of her home or at Fort Hayes. And delivered services to Southwest Kansas. And the beauty of that was she was training Fort Hayes students at the same time. So our students were hearing about telepractice before it became a huge reality. So yeah, you know, if you're not changing, that means you're not growing. So I feel like, um, yeah, there's been changes and it's, to me, it's been, challenging um but it's the real world of the real world of practice today so uh, harry wants to have a question that i think is a really good follow-up to what you were just talking about going out to ensign and working with them in telepractice um, he says one of the missions of fhsu is to look for ways to get our graduates to practice in western kansas i know that many rural communities need speech language pathologists what is needed or to, to be able to help in that area? Well, you know, um, what happened, I mean, and again, we would often talk as a department that, uh, and this was joking, that mostly females in our department, uh, and this was a while ago, uh, like when we were still in Malloy, um, we would um, look for, a lot of our students were from Western Kansas, and so, um, we secretly hoped that they would find a farmer in Western Kansas and go back to wherever their, you know, farmer boyfriend or fiance was from. And then that area would have um, a speech therapist. And I mean, again, that's just kind of silly talk, but um, to, and I know there've been initiatives where, um, if you, school districts have offered to pay fees for graduate school. I don't know that they've offered to pay for undergrad, but if you agree to come to, you know, um, whatever, uh, Gove County or, you know, wherever, I guess I'm running out of, Dodge City, some of those places actually, I think are pretty well staffed. But if you sign a contract to come back and work here for five years or however many years, then we will pay um, uh, tuition and book or yeah, books and tuition. And so some of our students have done that. And I think that was an incentive. Um, 
but it's hard. It's hard. Although I feel like all of this remote learning and telepractice is sort of closing that gap. Um, but I would be the first to say that not all children can benefit from telepractice. I mean, they just can't, you know, autism could be one young children. You're not going to plop a three-year-old in front of a, um, you know, computer and expect them to teach them how to say the SH sound or something. It just doesn't work. So there are uh, vacancies, I'm sure, but people are getting very creative. And again, I heard Jeff mention last week that the Dane Hansen Foundation has gotten involved with trying to recruit people, students of all majors to stay, well, get the their education and then go back home to live and work. So I hope that can make a difference. Um, Jeannie Billinger from here, from here in our office wants to know if there are any clients who have a special place in your heart or who were especially memorable. Yeah, definitely. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, there are. Um, and I, I don't know, some of the most challenging clients and difficult ones that would bite me and kick me and um, run the other direction when they saw me coming. And when those kinds of difficult children sort of came around and we worked together and again, with students help, you know, it was good for them to see children act that way because we all had a problem because we've got to get this figured out and then parents of course some of them were very helpful others sat back and apologized and others got upset with us because we were trying to take control and it was just one thing after another but you know i guess in my retirement i have um too much too many boxes to go through i still have boxes from when i retired that I haven't gone through, but um, it's really sweet because I've gotten um, some personal notes, like when kids graduate from high school or even back when they were little and they're just sweet notes from parents thanking me. So I have had some very special children that will always be special, but I don't know, I just, I, I've seen a lot of children over the years and um, some were really tough and some were really easy and fun and everybody in between. So I can't say I have a favorite one. I, I have to, well, let me refrain. The mother that wrote that letter about her son is probably my favorite. And I think Fred knew that, and that's probably why he had to write a letter. I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, you just, yeah, good question. And I think we have one last question for you. Um, okay. You talked about being retired and going through boxes and all of that. Well, so what, what are you doing to keep busy in your retirement, and what do you miss about being with us here on campus? Oh, my. Okay. So um, I retired when I was 62, which was a little bit early, but the problem, not the problem, he would, Danny wouldn't like, my husband wouldn't like to be called a problem, but he decided to um, stop farming. Um, just because he was by himself, we have three kids, nobody wants to farm. Um, so he said, Marla, I'm retiring and you can do what you want, you know, it's okay, but when I'm gone or I travel to see grandkids, I don't want you to be upset with me. It's like, okay, I got it. And so I just thought about it and thought about it. And I thought, I think I'll retire too. So I retired and in July, in, a, in the summer, summer of 14. And summer was just, I was hiring a kite. It was just lovely. No, just all the freedom. And then fall and winter come. And I look out my living room window and I am choking here in this house. I'm wondering what I've done to myself. There's nobody to talk to. And 
yeah, I was missing people so badly, so badly. And, you know, I miss the people, I miss the students, I miss the people I worked with, I miss the parents. I just thought, I just, maybe I shouldn't have retired, but you know, the train had left the station and I was home. Um, and so what I did um, was great. I decided, and I really didn't realize how good it was gonna be until I got there. I decided I was gonna volunteer at the ARC thrift store um, down on South Main because I believed in the, um, like their mission or their goal. The funds that are raised from that store go to adults with disabilities. And so I thought, well, you know, I focused on little kids with disabilities. So now I'm going to do what I can to help adults. But here's the cool part. So one day I walk into work and I only usually am in the back room opening donations. I, that I'm not good at being a cashier. Um, but so I'm in the back room. And so who is there but one of the, the it's an adult with a disability, but he's actually one of the children I worked with back in the 80s. Um, and his mom uh, is also a volunteer there. And anyway, so I, and since then I've run into two or three other adults that I knew and one of them remembered me. I think it was, they remembered me mainly because their parents sort of made them remember me. I don't know. Um, but they don't remember me and that's just fine, but they're doing so well and they're helping and they have a spot that they can of, of, of a job or a duty that they are so proud of and it's it's just so much fun to see them um and you know we just chit and chat and i've helped them learn a new task and we'll visit so yeah my volunteerism at the ark i feel like i've come full circle and not even deliberately but um it's been great. And I go there, I think I try to spend two days a week there, two afternoons a week, and it's a highlight of my week. So my life's changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, you know what, I lied though. We have what one did more. You okay. One more question, if that's all right for you. Sure. Um, and actually we have two people who've commented on this, this uh, both Cindy Elliott and um, Mehran Shahidi. Um, Oh. Talk, talking about your ability to, or your work with helping international students uh, reduce their accents. Um, oh. Cindy says they loved you and are so appreciative of you. Um, let me see what Mayron says. Um, okay. You know, can I just make a comment? Um, yeah, I, you know, I didn't talk at all about that, um, but I did teach a class called Accent Modification for International speakers and you know here's again i love to tell stories so invariably it happened not every semester but probably um every other semester i would hand out the course syllabus and and just explain if they were in the right class did they really want to be here i would do my best to help them so somebody would raise their hand and they would and then I would say something like, if you have any special requests for the class or activities, let me know, because I want to be responsive to your needs. And um, hand would go up and the international student, and I think most of these comments came from um, Chinese students because they were so polite and how, but I heard it several times. The uh, student would say, teacher, I want to sound just like you when I'm finished with this class. And I said, oh my, <laughs> that's not going to happen. There again, I'm just blatantly honest. I said, if that's not going to happen, I said, I'm going to try my best to help you. And you have to try your best to participate and watch and listen and learn. But I said, let me remind you of one thing that I speak 
English. I have no accent. I know one language. You, on the other hand, know two languages, possibly three. And I admire you. I respect that you are here halfway across the world at Fort Hayes and wanting to improve your English. And I'm going to do my best to help you. But you will not sound like me when we finish this class. And then they would say, okay, thank you, teacher. I mean, it was just sweet and kind. And yet I was in awe of them because they were multilingual. And here I am, I can speak English. <laughs> so you didn't learn any Chinese or any other languages? Oh, I tried to learn a few phrases, but then when I would try to use them and act like, okay, I can respond, they would just snicker because I had no idea what I was saying and I was trying to write phonetically what I heard. And anyway, we had good times together and I do miss, and I have some uh, Chinese friends that I still keep in touch with. I really miss that group because um, they were fun. And we talked a lot, you know, did they sound a lot different when they left my class? Mm, probably not. At least you gave them a good foundation, right? I think I did. I tried. That's the important part. All right. Well, I don't believe I see any other questions and we are certainly, you know, approaching that, you know, we're, we're well past the 45 minute mark. So uh, to be respectful of folks time, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. But I think Tammy has a few uh, comments she wants to make and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Okay, yep. thank you, Charlene. You've been fun to talk to. I just, I think there's a joke in here that, um, that all of you will appreciate. And it, and it goes something like this. How many alumni office staff members does it take to get Marla Staub to accept an award? <laughs> oh dear. I mean, maybe a show of hand. No, this woman, <laughs> Oh, this woman is one of the most humble, and and I and it was so cute to hear you say it, um, that you told Fred Britton almost verbatim what you've told me, but I was just doing my job. Yeah, and yeah. I think that is the spirit of what, why you're being honored today, Marla. Thank you for all you've done, and oh yeah, Brooke's got the pom poms going. Yeah. So, <laughs> It's it, and it's been interesting to hear you talk about the children in your life, and I just have to do a shout out that you certainly touched all ages. My father-in-law, after his stroke, oh, saw yeah. your team, and you know, and so the the work that is being done that that many of you started years ago, and and it's and it's continuing to impact our community in in ways that goes beyond just education. Um, sure of educating our new next you know professionals yeah. so thank you for that and 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 i i certainly want to thank the alumni team um for convincing you but also for all their help with the homecoming activities to the foundation staff uh, for also helping give a lot of value back to um getting others uh entered into the the system so that they could join us and so that, I just, I needed to do that shout out, but Charlene, it's yours to wrap up. Thanks for letting me have my little, little time, but, and, and thanks, thanks again, Marla, Marla, for saying yes. Thanks. Well, I just want to thank you for, for uh, agreeing to let me quiz you a little bit here this afternoon. I hope it wasn't too painful for you. Um, and um, I want to remind everyone that this is only the second of seven of these sessions that we'll have. So we will be back tomorrow morning, or not tomorrow morning, but tomorrow at noon. It's going to feel like morning. Um, tomorrow we um, have Dan Weller at noon and then uh, Doug Hurt at three o'clock. So hopefully uh, if you're available, y'all will come join us for that as well. Marla, the, the chat is, is blowing up with all kinds of people uh, wishing you well and congratulating you and thanking okay. you for, for your Thank story. You. I want you to know that. But um, if you have, uh, if you want to see the rest of the schedule, certainly uh, come join us at gofortestate.com slash homecoming2020. That's the rest of the schedule for the week. We have lots of fun activities, so we hope you will join us for those as well. And again, on behalf of all of us, Marla, congratulations. Oh, one special activity I should probably point out, Thursday evening, all of our award recipients will be receiving 
their awards uh, at a ceremony that we on uh, Facebook Live starting at 7 p.m. So um, I hope you will for sure join us for that as well. So Marla, again, thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us and for all of your great questions. And we look forward to seeing you all next time.